Hello, squirrels. Well, I've done it again. It's 1030. I've got these on, but if they bother you, close your eyes. Or just look at your crocheting or your knitting. i just get off on them. But do let me know if they bother you, and I won't do it again. Okay, we're on chapter 14. So this is what we're calling part two. Because I wondered if Dr. Murray had a reason for mentioning them. You mean he connected? Left off. I think he connected up three classical cases that are well known and tried them on, as it were, like a glove to see if they fit anyone at Sunny Ridge. I think in a way any of them might have fit. Miss Packard would fit in with the first one. The efficient matron of a home. You really have got your knife into that woman. I always liked her. I dare say people have liked murderers, said Tuppence very reasonably. It's like swindlers and confidence tricksmen who always look so honest and seem so honest. I dare say murderers all seem very nice and particularly soft-hearted, that sort of thing. Anyway, Miss Packard is very efficient, and she has all the means to hand whereby she could produce a nice natural death without suspicion. And only someone like Mrs. Coco would be likely to suspect her. Mrs. Coco might suspect her because she's a bit batty herself and can understand batty people. Or she might have come across her somewhere before. I don't think Miss Packard would profit financially by any of her elderly inmates' deaths. You don't know, said Tuppence. It would be a clever way to do it not to benefit from all of them. Just get one or two of them. Perhaps rich ones to leave you a lot of money, but to always have some deaths that were quite natural as well, and where you didn't get anything. So you see, I think that Dr. Murray might, just might, have, a ca have cast a glance at Miss Packard and said to himself, nonsense, I'm imagining things. But all the same, the thought stuck in his mind, the second case he mentioned would fit with a domestic worker or cook or even some kind of hospital nurse. Somebody employed in the place, a middle-aged, reliable woman, but who was batty in that particular way, perhaps used to have little grudges, dislikes for some of the patients there. We can't go guessing at that because I don't think we know anyone well enough. And the third one? The third one's more difficult, Tuppence admitted. Someone devoted, dedicated. Remember that one nurse? She wasn't going to be there very much longer, she said. Wonder what that was. Perhaps he just added that for good measure, said Tommy. He added, I wonder about that Irish nurse. That's, that's the one. The nice one we gave the first stole to? Yes, the nice one Aunt Ada liked. The very sympathetic one. She seemed so fond of everyone. So sorry if they died. She was very worried when she spoke to us, wasn't she? You said you said so. She was leaving. And she didn't really tell us why. I, su I suppose she might have been a rather neurotic type. Nurses, nurses aren't supposed to be too sympathetic. It's bad for patients. They're told to be cool and efficient and inspire confidence. Nurse Beersford speaking, said Tommy and grinned. But to come back to the picture, said Tuppence, if we just concentrate on the picture, because I think it's very interesting what you told me about Mrs. Boscawan. When you went to see her, she sounds, she sounds interesting. She was interesting, said Tommy, quite the most interesting interesting person I think we've come across in this unusual business, the sort of person who seems to know things, but not by thinking about them. 
it was as though she knew something about this place that I didn't and that perhaps you don't, but she knows something. It was odd what she said about the boat, said Tuppence, that the pitcher hadn't had a boat originally. Why do you think it's got a boat now? Oh, said Tommy, I don't know. Was there any name painted on the boat? I don't remember seeing one, but then I never looked at it very closely. It's got water lily on it. A very appropriate name for a boat. What does that remind me of? I've no idea. And she was quite positive that her husband didn't paint the boat. He could have put it in afterwards. She says not. She was very definite. Of course not, said Tuppence. There's another possibility we haven't we haven't gone into about my caution. I mean, the outsider, somebody perhaps who followed me here from Market Basing that day to see what I was up to because I'd been there asking all these questions, going into all those houses house agents, Blodgett and Burgess and all the rest of them, they put me off about the house. They were evasive, more evasive than would be natural. It was the same sort of evasion as we had when we were trying to find out where Mrs. Lancaster had gone. Lawyers and banks, an owner who can't be communicated with them because he's abroad, the same sort of pattern. Uh, they send someone to follow my car. They want to see what I'm doing, and in in due course, I'm coshed. <laughs> Knocked upside the head. Which brings us, said Tuppence, to the gravestone in the churchyard. Why didn't anyone want, want me to look at old gravestones? They were all pulled about anyway. A group of boys, I should say who'd get bored with us <coughs> wrecking telephone boxes and went into the churchyard to have some fun and sacrilege behind the church. Yes, done with a chisel, I should think, someone who gave it up as a bad job. The name Water Lily and the age, seven years old, that was done properly, and then the other bits of words that looked like whosoever. And then, a thin least of these, and millstone. Sounds familiar. It should do. It's definitely biblical, but done by someone who wasn't quite sure what the words he wanted to remember were. Very odd, the whole thing. Uh, very odd, the whole thing. And why anyone should object, I was only trying to help the vicar and the poor man who was trying to find his lost child. There we are, back to the lost child motif again. Mrs. Lancaster talked about a poor child walled up behind a fireplace. And Mrs. Copley chattered about walled up nuns and murdered children. Uh, children. And a mother who killed a baby and a lover and an illegitimate baby and a suicide. It's all old tales and gossips and hearsay. Uh, hearsay and legends mixed up in the most glorious kind of hasty pudding. <laughs> I'll turn this off. It's probably driving y'all nuts. Okay, hasty pudding. Well, it's all gone. All the same, Tommy, there was one actual fact, not just hearsay or legend. You mean? I mean that in the chimney of this canal house, this old rag doll fell out. A child's doll. It had been there a very, very long time. All covered with soot and rubble. Pity we haven't got it, said Tommy. I have, said Tuppet. She spoke triumphantly. You brought it away with you? 
Yes, it, it startled me, you know. I thought I'd like to take it and examine it. Nobody wanted it. Uh, let's see. Nobody wanted it or anything. I should imagine the Perrys would just have thrown it into the ash can straight away. I've, I've got it here. She rose from her sofa, went to her suitcase, rummaged a little, and then brought out something wrapped in newspaper. Here you are, Tommy. Have a look. With some curiosity, Tommy unwrapped the newspaper. He took out carefully the wreck of a child's doll. Its limp arms and legs hung down, faint festoons of clothing. Dropped off as he touched them. The body seemed made of a very thin suede leather. Uh, sewn up over a body that had once been plump with sawdust. And now was sagging because here and there the sawdust had escaped. As Tommy handled it, and he was quite gentle in his touch, the body suddenly disintegrated, flapping over in a great wound from which there poured out a cupful of sawdust, and with it, small pebbles that ran to and fro about the floor. Tommy went round, picking them up carefully. Good Lord, he said to himself, good Lord. I wonder what it is. Could be diamonds or something. How odd, Tuppence said. It's full of pebbles. Is that a bit of the chimney disintegrating, do you think? The plaster or something crumbling away? No, said Tommy. These pebbles were inside the body. <clears throat> He had gathered them up now carefully, he poked his finger into the carcass of the doll, and a few more pebbles fell out. He took them over to the window and turned them over in his hand. Tuppence watched him with uncomprehending eyes. It's a funny idea. Stuffing a doll with pebbles, she said. Well, they're not exactly the usual kind of pebbles, said Tommy. They're vi there was a very good reason for it, I should imagine. What do you mean? Have a look at them. Handle a few. She took some wonderingly from his hand. They're nothing but pebbles, she said. Some are rather large and some are small. Why are you just so excited? Because, Tuppets, I'm beginning to understand things. These aren't pebbles, my dear girl. They're diamonds. <laughs> I didn't look ahead. And then chapter 15. Evening at the Vicarage. Diamonds, Tuppets gasped. Looking from him to the pebbles she still held in her hand, she said. These dusty-looking look, dusty things? Diamonds? Tommy nodded. It's beginning to make sense now. You see, you see, Tuppence, it ties up the canal house, the pictures, the wait. The wait until Ivor Smith hears about that dock. No, you wait. You wait till he hears. He's got a bouquet waiting for you already, Tuppence. <laughs> what for? For helping to round up a big criminal gang. You and your Ivor Smith. I suppose that's where you've been all this last week. Abandoning me in my last days of convalescence. <laughs> in that dreary hospital. Just when I wanted brilliant conversation and a lot of cheering up. I came in visiting hours practically every evening. You didn't tell me much. I was warned by that dragon of a sister not to excite you. But Ivor himself is coming. Is coming here the day after tomorrow. And we've got a little social evening laid out. Laid on at the vicarage. Who's coming? Mrs. Boscoan, one of the big local landowners. You, your friend, Miss Nellie Bly, the vicar, of course. You and I. Uh, you and I. 
and Mr. Iver Smith. What's his real name? As far as I know, it's Iver Smith. <laughs> I-V-O-R. You're always so cautious, Tuppence laughed suddenly. What's amusing you? I was just thinking that I'd like to have seen you and Albert discovering secret drawers <laughs> in Aunt Ada's desk. All the credit goes to Albert. He positively delivered a lecture on the subject. He learned all about it in his youth from an antique dealer. Fancy your Aunt Ada really having a secret document like that. All done up. <clears throat> all done up with seals all over. She didn't actually know anything, but she was ready to believe there was somebody in Sunny Ridge who was dangerous. I wonder if she knew. <clears throat> wonder if she knew. Miss Dangerous. I wonder if she knew it was Miss Packard. That's only your idea. It's a very good idea if it's a criminal gang we're looking for. They'd need a place like Sunny Ridge, respectable and well run with a competent criminal to run it. Someone properly qualified to have access to drugs whenever she needed them. Uh. <clears throat> Doggone her, <laughs> in case she needed them. And by accepting any deaths that occurred is quite natural. It would influence a doctor to think they were quite all right. You've got it all ta tapped out, taped out, taped out. But actually, the real reason you started to suspect, suspect. <laughs> Miss Packard was because you didn't like her teeth. <laughs> The better to eat you with, said Tuppence meditatively. <laughs> Is that word again? I'll tell you something else, Tom, Tommy. Tommy! <laughs> I can't read. <laughs> I'll tell you something else, Tommy. Supposing this picture, the picture of the canal house, never belonged to Mrs. Lancaster at all. But we know it did, Tommy stared at her. No, we don't. We only know that Miss Packard said so. It was Miss Packard who said that Mrs. La Mrs. Lancaster gave it to Aunt Ada. But why should Tommy, Tommy stop? Perhaps that's why Mrs. Lancaster was taken away so that she shouldn't tell us that the picture didn't belong to her and that she didn't give it to Aunt Ada. I think that's a very far-fetched idea, perhaps, but the picture was painted in Sutton Chancellor. Uh, the house in the picture is a house. Uh, no, it was painted there, so. The house in the picture is a house in Sutton Chancellor. We've reason to believe that this house, excuse me, is or was used as one of their hidey holes <laughs> by a criminal association. Mr. Eccles is believed to be the man behind this gang. Mr. Eccles was the man responsible for sending Mrs. for sending Mrs. Johnson to remove Mrs. Lancaster. I don't believe it. <clears throat> Mrs. Lancaster was, I don't believe Mrs. Lancaster was ever in Sutton Chancer or was ever in the canal house or had a picture of it, though I think she heard someone at Sunny Ridge talk about it. Mrs. Coco, perhaps? So she started chattering, and that was dangerous, so she had to be removed. And one day I shall find her, mark my words, Tommy. The Quest of Mrs. Thomas Beersford. And I'll stop there. We'll be at part two in whatever chapter. What is this? Fifteen. Yeah. Yes, we'll stop right there.
Sorry, I'm trying to mark the place. There we go. Oh, shoot. Okay. KKK. Stop it. Oh, oh. I get a fix in a minute. I love y'all. Have a good sleep if you're up late listening to this. Or have a good day. And tomorrow I'll just see you in the YT streets. It'll be Tuesday. So Kelly's Crochet Adventures will have us over at her house tomorrow night. I hope you make it. It'll be, gosh, these weeks just fly by, don't they? It'll be Tur What's it called? Turbo Tuesday again. Kelly's Crochet Adventures. 7.05-ish Eastern Time. Love y'all. See you later. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Bye-bye.